So let's go ahead and just take a look back. And I'm going to give a few passages that you typically think of whenever you hear a lesson on modesty, about what to wear, what not to wear. One of the first passages, and I believe rightfully so, comes from Genesis chapter 3. And, and you'll remember that in this account, Adam and Eve have disobeyed their God. They eat of the fruit in which God had told them not to eat. And so here we come. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. For the first time, they... They looked at themselves and realized something was different. They didn't have this realization before. And they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And I want you to take note of what the man said. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was what? Maybe that's a weird one to say out loud. Because I was naked. Okay? Sorry. That was a bad one to ask there. Because I was, because I was naked, and I, and I hid myself. Listen, I, I tell you what, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand just a, a few simple rules in this exegesis. Number one, they were naked. Fair enough? I know they were naked because it says they were naked because their eyes were open and they went, whoa. So they were naked. And I know something else, that they sewed fig leaves together to, to cover themselves, to, to cover the, the, the private areas. There's, there's my PG version of that. And, and there you go. But what I also know is that whenever they heard the sound of God walking in the garden, they hid themselves. And Adam is going to tell you why he hid. Because I was he still considered himself to be naked. Now listen, brethren, I understand, and I'm going to be fair to all these passages. I know that, especially as I get into the next couple of passages, we're not underneath the old law. But just understand some principle here. There is such a thing as being naked. And there is some interesting conversation that we can get to. We can get to it more in the back as far as culture. But I can tell you one thing. Just because a culture runs around naked doesn't make that right. And I also believe, I really do believe that a culture can even become used to being naked, but it doesn't make it right. They were naked, they made loincloths, not acceptable to God. He closed them. And I know that because of verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And I'm going to go ahead and say something shocking. I'm not going to try to get into the Hebrew or Greek in any of these terms to try to give you a definition of what clothed meant. And I'm going to tell you why I don't think we have to do that. And I'm going to tell you why I think that if we have to go to those links, then we are missing the part of holiness. We are missing the concept of what God wants for us. But just hang in there with me. So really basic principles. And I know also that whenever we get into this topic, typically these passages are going to come up. So this is an instruction specifically to the priests and their sons. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness be not exposed on it. God's actually going to take care of this later on. He's going to give some instruction. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear, bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. And after that, someone may follow up and remind you that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we can tie that concept of a priest and how they were covered down to the thighs and how you are, are a royal priesthood. Let me tell you what to take and what not to take from that. Let's be fair with the scriptures. Number one, let me say this. There are a lot of specific things given to those priests and there were more that they were supposed to, to, to wear. Some of those things made sense as far as modesty. Some of them had no bearing on that whatsoever. Matter of fact, you can get to, I believe it's Ezekiel chapter 44, 17 through 19. That's an interesting one where they're told not to wear any more garments, not to wear wool lest they sweat. Also, when they're done, to take these garments off to make sure that they're not given among the people lest the holiness be spread. <laughs> really weird as Eddie was talking about this this morning, just coincidentally how much some of it kind of tied into some of these principles denied. That just shows the holiness of God, though, is my point. So holy was this position, don't even let your garments go out lest they be spread to the people. That's pretty awesome. 
But I don't want to go too far with this. Yes, we are a royal priesthood. That does not mean that their clothing is, is being bound on you. But I will say this, you need to have a royal priesthood mindset. And I believe that we can agree upon. And I will just say, for this guy's opinion, just generally speaking, probably sho shoulder to the knee is probably not a good, probably not a bad uh, judgment there. I'm not binding that on anyone. Just an observation. Just an observation. But God at least wanted him to be clothed in this way. I can go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 when we're talking about modesty and dress. I can read how a woman should not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. And there are many concepts that are reiterated in the New Covenant. And I think this principle is reiterated in the New Covenant. Men are men and women are women. For whatever it's worth, whenever I was doing a little bit of research, and I'm not going to blow this out of proportion, I wasn't doing tons and tons, but just to get an idea of what was the New Testament dress like for men and women, you know what I found? It wasn't that different. So here's what it looked like. Generally speaking, they had, they had some undergarments, a cloth, linen cloth that they would wear. Okay, They would have a cloak that they would put on that would typically go down to the knees, if maybe not a little bit longer. And they would have uh, sandals, and then they would have a belt that they would tie on. Whenever it talks about gird your loins, the idea is that strap your belt on, because without a belt, it's very loose and, loose and flu flowing, and it's actually hard to run and, and, and get away hastily or work. So you would put that belt on, and it was actually easier to work. But what I learned is that what they would do is, since they were basically wearing the same clothes, the women would have a little bit more, maybe different fabric or a little bit more color to distinguish between the male and the female. For whatever it's worth, I learned that pretty much they, they weren't crazy about makeup, um, and they would braid their hair. And in our culture today, no offense, we'd call it pretty plain Jane. That's, that's what it was, pretty, pretty straight, stored, forward stuff, Okay. Um, Deuteronomy 25, and the point I'm bringing this up is to reiterate the same point. There are principles, obviously, of the old law that are not binding. And I don't want to, uh, anyone to be confused about what I'm saying or what I'm not saying. For example, you shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. Uh, you're not bound by this, or this principle. You shall not make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. Okay? So be careful whenever you're talking to someone about some of these passages that you're articulating the principle. And then if it's the principle, be fair-minded and reiterate what those principles are in the New Covenant. But guys, here, here's what I do want us to pick up on. Whether we like it or not, we can get in debate all day long, but clothes communicate. They, they really do say something. I could have 15 pictures up here of different men and women, and just based on what they're wearing, you are going to come, come away with a different opinion of each of those individuals. And today in our society, we, do, we don't like this kind of talk, but it's true. <laughs> it's very true. They communicate something. Genesis chapter 38, verses 13 through 15. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance of Enium, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. She was supposed to be given in marriage, and Judah basically is stalling. That's kind of the backstory behind this, and she's upset about it. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for why? Why? He thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. You can get mad all day long. Oh, well, that shouldn't have been right. You can't judge a woman by... Yeah. <laughs> she did. She wrapped herself on purpose because he associated that with a harlot. Proverbs 7, verses 10 through 12. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute. <laughs> What does that mean? Why, well, I promise you, the Jews back then understood what that meant. 
They understood it. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. And the reason why I wanted to add that is that this isn't just dress. This is about attitude. It's about everything. You knew she was a prostitute not only by the things that she would wear, but by her behavior. That's why I don't think these things are are truly separated from one another. You can read in Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. You remember that Joseph's been in prison for a couple years. And finally, he's remembered how he had helped out, and, and, uh, and he's called to Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Why did he need to shave himself and change his clothes? Because he needed to dress the part. Because those clothes and how he presents himself communicated something to the Pharaoh. And it would be highly inappropriate For him to present himself to Pharaoh in that way. You can read in 2 Kings chapter 1, 7 through 8. The king of Israel in Samaria is sick. He wants to know, am I going to recover? He sends messengers to to, uh, inquire from false gods. This is interesting. So God ends up talking to Elijah and says, is it because there's no God in Israel? (laughs) So go and meet his messengers and tell him that I'm saying this. He's a dead man. And so that's what Elijah does. And he meets the messengers, and they come back, and they report report this to the king. He said to them, what kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, ah, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Yeah, I know who that is. Sound familiar? John the Baptist? Wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Guys, this was weird. This was, this was not common. And people would take notice. Now, they weren't doing that so that they would just get attention. Matter of fact, there's a passage in Zechariah that perhaps hints the idea that, that some of these prophets would wear these camel's hair, that it distinguished them. Well, if that's true, it just goes on to show the point. Their clothing would communicate, for example, who they were. Or their purpose. Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 2, 11 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind them hand and foot, and cast them into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. I'm going to make this point, and I'm going to move on. We are going to be wasting our time trying to sit around arguing if dress matters or if it communicates something. It does. Can we move past that, please? I mean, really, can we move past that? And now let's start getting to the heart of the matter. Listen to what God communicates. When he talks about the men lifting holy hands, he continues on. It says, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. And I always like to back that up with 1 Peter 3, 3 3-4, because sometimes we have a misunderstanding that God is saying you can't wear certain things. Like maybe a woman's hair cannot be braided or she can't wear jewelry. I think this complements it very nicely. Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And brethren, I'm going to tell you too, I'm not going to go into the Greek behind these terms of modesty. Do you need me to do that? Or do you get what it's saying? Do you understand what God is saying? My sisters in Christ. So sometimes when we're talking about clothing, we immediately go to the taking off. And I will say this though. Remember, Adam and Eve covered themselves, loincloths, if you will. 
you, you need to cover your privates. And I, and I will, I'll be bold enough to say that. Cover yourself. Please cover yourself. Th those things are not for other men to see. And they're not for other women to see. They're for your spouse. There's a time and a place for that. Please cover yourself. But let me also say this. It's more than just about taking off. It's also going to be what you're putting on. Because either way, what's happening is we're saying, look at me. And we may be saying, look at me for, for different reasons. It may be a sex appeal, if I can just be blunt. Or it may be, look at me, I'm wealthy and I'm important and I'm better. All of these things, the bottom line, what they're doing is they're causing people to focus in on you and not on God. And so a word of encouragement to my sisters in Christ, you know what God cares about more than anything? You have lovely hair, long hair, braided hair, that's wonderful. But, but let your beauty be in the inside. And don't be distracted. It is this Proverbs 31 woman that you love to hear about and you love to read about, and rightfully so. But hear it again. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. My precious sisters in Christ, if there's anyone in particular, and probably with all cultures, that has pressure to look and dress a way that they, sh that they shouldn't be, it is specifically on the women, I think more so. And so you have got to be careful of that. Don't mind what the world says and what they call attractive and lovely, so on and so forth. Listen to your God. And that's the only voice that you should be hearing. So I do think we should cover up. And by the way, remember this, God's not a God of loopholes. I just want to throw something out for, for, with you, just something to think about, okay? This is just something for you to think about. But my girls, whenever they go back to school, they already have clothes restrictions. And you know what they can't do? They can't wear leggings without shorts or a dress. Now, I just want you to think about that. That is the world standard. The secular school is saying, hey, let's, let's cover yourself more. Why is that? Because they realize that that clothing is so tight, as we use this phrase all the time, it leaves nothing to the imagination. I just want us to chew on that. If the world is understanding that, don't you think maybe we should at least give that some thought? It's not about loopholes. It's about this. What is pleasing to my God? And you filter it through that, I think you're going to get it right every single time. But guys, we're not off the hook. Listen up. <laughs> when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So this is Samuel to anoint the next king. But he doesn't know which one it is. And David's brothers are coming out. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And who was he? It's, da it's David. And listen, that's great that he had beautiful eyes and he's ruddy and handsome, but that's not why God chose him. Simple enough. Men, we need to be told the same thing. God's not concerned about what we look like on the outside. He's after men, with the, after men who are after his own heart. And we can get caught up in the same thing. We're not typically known of wearing short shorts. I hope not. But we can do it in other ways. Where you're trying to still communicate to someone, look at me. And it's a temptation. We all are in this together and we have to reevaluate why are we doing what we're doing? By what we say, by, by how we, we, we hold ourselves in front of people, by how we walk. Really, preacher, are you going to start talking about how we walk? Yeah, I actually do. I think, I think you even need to consider how you present yourself before people and what that's communicating and what 
what we wear. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 16, I think this wraps up all of us need to be mindful. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. So just a couple more passages, and then the sermon is yours. What we need to be communicating. I like the, the principle behind 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19-23. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. Let me tell you how this can be abused. I became all things to all people, so I'm going to dress like everyone. Nope, total abuse of that passage, and you know it. So don't even go there. I'm not saying you are, but don't. Don't even go there. What you need to pick up is how he's willing to do everything to win everyone. You know, my point here is not to get into this great debate about how we dress when we come to worship God. But I will say this, and I'll say it specifically to, to some of the, the younger people. Be very careful that you don't belittle us presenting ourselves and mocking the idea of dressing up for services. Because here's what I want to tell you. And we can talk about this more. But there is a culture among us. And I think you need to be mindful of that. And, and that culture can go wrong. Hear me out. But if Paul walked in these doors, I guarantee you, he would look around and he would learn and he would adapt. And he would do what was right and modest and respectful. So as not to cause anyone to stumble, but to win or encourage everyone. Amen. And everything we're doing, when we're outside, we love those outside the body or whoever they may be, and we learn to adapt in the appropriate right way. But you keep your holiness, that sanctified thing about you, so that you may win them. Have that mind like Christ, where he counts other people more significant than himself, Philippians chapter 2. If you love me and you want the best for me and want me to win and you to win, then don't be a stumbling block to me. And I'm not going to be a stumbling block to you. And we can do that by how we dress. Let's help save each other. Matthew chapter 15, 16 through 20. And he said that as Christ, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, uh, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Now, this passage, whenever, whenever you think about what you wear, and then you compare it through this lens... You, you may come out feeling very good and confident, and God bless you. But, but let me take another angle at this. Number one, I'm saying consider what God wants and what's pleasing to Him and what's helpful to others. I hope that that convicts you. But I want you to think about it through this angle. If you're not spiritually tuned in, many times what you're doing, what you are doing is going right, right over your head and you don't realize it. And people that are spiritually tuned in can see it from a mile away. And sometimes what you think you're doing is totally oblivious. Everyone else is oblivious to it, but, but we're not. Here's the thing. If your motive in your heart is, is wrong, it'll come out in how you dress. And everyone else can see it. You are on display your heart 
is on display. Now I want you to think about that. Whenever the people look at you, how does your heart look? I mean, that can make you feel kind of naked. <laughs> but understand this, before God, there's no hiding it. Everyone is exposed and naked before Him. And He sees perfectly the intent of every single one of us. And finally, brother, Titus chapter 2, 9-14. through 14, I tell you what, if you want to be clothed, if you want to be adorned with something, be adorned by the doctrine of, of our Lord and Savior, of our God. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I just want to repeat this one more time. Brethren, if you are needing for some man or woman to sit down with you and pull out a ruler, you are already missing the point. And, and by the way, you notice I did not have that for you this evening. But what I do have you is, is the heart and the mind of God. And, and what I do have for you is reminding you who you are to Him. What I will reiterate is the principle that Eddie talked about this morning. He has sanctified you and He set you apart for Him. So glorify Him in your bodies, brethren. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. And here's the thing. If you're sitting there thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm feeling kind of exposed right now. This point is not to judge you. This point is to encourage you. These things can be taken care of. And they may be done in ignorance. There also be made some that are new to the faith that just haven't thought about this. Do not misunderstand what we're doing. But let's grow closer to the, to the Lord. Help others out. We're all in this together. If we need... Uh, if you need anything from us um, at all, we're here for you to encourage you, study with you, pray for you. Uh, but more than anything, brethren, we're here to offer uh, Christ's invitation. Let me tell you, Christ knew something about clothing. Uh, he's clothed with righteousness. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, this is someone who's, who uh, his robe has been dipped in blood so that yours may be cleansed, so that you may have a robe of righteousness. And, and you have this ability to be clothed, to put on Christ. He, he understands clothing. The Holy Spirit communicates this in many wonderful ways. It is, it is our, our Christ. Matter of fact, you, you talk about clothing. You go through this whole crucifixion scene and how they mocked him. These soldiers took off his clothes and they put the scarlet purple uh, robe on him and and they mocked him, and then they put these crowns of thorns on his head. And then they took those off after they were done playing with the anointed one and put his clothes back on him. And then, and then they crucified our Lord, and they put him up on the cross. And, and then this was a fun one. Then, then they take his garments, and, and they divide him. And he's sitting up there exposed. As they cast lots for who's going to get his garments. That's just one of those embarrassing details you think that our Christ suffered. And he did that, brethren, so that you could put him on. And this is your invitation right now. And you can take advantage of that as together we stand and we sing.